U.S. flag? Okay, so the U.S. flag is going to the Wilkinson family. Okay, so it's right here. On the right here. Gotcha. Okay, that's making care of that. That's making care of He didn't know who was going to be. Right, right. I thought I did. The two flags on the street. Right, and that's really the separate event. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Nautilus March, written by George Jenks and performed by the United States Coast Guard Band under the, under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Adam Williamson. Thank you. Our ceremony is about to begin. Please silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Submarine Force Library and Museum and Historic Ship Nautilus. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the ship that revolutionized naval warfare. I am Lieutenant Commander Benjamin Amder, officer in charge of this historic ship, and it is my honor to serve as today's Master of Ceremonies. In keeping with naval traditions, honors will be rendered to members of the official party. These include side boys, bells, piping aboard, ruffles and flourishes, and the Admiral's March. Military guests in uniform should remain uncovered for the duration of the ceremony and need not salute during honors. Uh, they will also, you also need not salute for parading of the colors and the playing of the national anthem. Guests, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing until the completion of the invocation. Mr. Will Lennon, Electric Boat Vice President. Captain, United States Navy retired, arriving. Captain, United States Navy retired, arriving. Naval reactors arriving. Member, United States Congress, arriving. Member, United States Senate, arriving.
Governor, Connecticut, arriving. Retire the side boys. <laughs> Parade the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Color guard, retire the colors. Chaplain Price will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, today we gather in the shadow of history to thank you for your past faithfulness to us and to renew our commitment to the future. Sixty years ago, we ushered in a new era in history 
as we commissioned USS Nautilus for service to our Navy, our country, and our world. And through it all, she has exceeded all of our expectations and continues to inspire us through her valor, her determination, and her commitment to excellence. To those who served with her, this boat was more than a vessel. It became home. And the crew that served with her became more than a family. They became a brotherhood who served with distinction, with honor, and with courage. Whether it was sailing under the polar ice cap or standing resolute in the face of the enemy, Nautilus embodies the American spirit that will not waver in the face of any challenge or retreat in the face of any enemy. We thank you for all who served and who continue to serve with Nautilus and for their families who have served along with them. And we ask that we would live up to their legacy now and forever. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Guests, please be seated. We would like to acknowledge the presence of so many distinguished guests here today. Your presence with us underscores the importance of Nautilus and the submarine force to our community, our state, and the nation. Uh, Rear Admiral Stoltz, Superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy. Rear Admiral Gable, our Submarine Force Library and Museum Association President. Rear Admiral Metzel, Fourth Commanding Officer of Nautilus. Rear Admiral Rydell, the Ninth Commanding Officer of Nautilus. Mr. John Wolfe, the General Manager of Bechtel Marine Propulsion Corporation, which operates both the Bettis and Knowles Atomic Power Laboratories where this nation's nuclear propulsion systems, including Nautilus, were developed. Mr. Doug Brandt from uh, Groton and Ripco. The many electric boat company executives and employees and other local business leaders, local elected leaders, and a special welcome to Mrs. Eleanor Rickover. I would also like to extend a special welcome to our crew, designers, and builders that made the vision of a nuclear-powered submarine a reality 60 years ago today. We are honored to have some of those pioneers and visionaries with us today. With the plank owners, designers, and builders of USS Nautilus, please raise a hand. We are further honored by the presence of so many family members of these heroes, many of whom are representing plank owners that could not be with us today. Would you please also raise your hand? Family of Nautilus. <laughs> Plank owners with us today include uh, Sonarman Jerry Armstrong, Captain David Boyd, uh, Torpedo Man James Curran, IC Man Elmer Durang, Torpedo Man Bill Engdahl, Captain Ray Engdahl, uh, William Bill O'Halloran, that's a Chief or Lieutenant Commander O'Halloran. Master Chief Rob Bringer, and Quartermaster Donald Strickland. Uh, we have family from uh, Vice Admiral Wilkinson here, Claire Billings and Alfredo Limson. Designers and builders, uh, Bernie Resnick from Naval Reactors. Uh, Lieutenant Henry Nardone from Soup Chip. Lieutenant Ruth Small from Naval Reactors. And Mr. Farqua from Electric Boat. Ladies and gentlemen, Connecticut's second congestional can get Congressional District is fortunate to have a congressman who is known for his incredible support of our military members and their families and as an outspoken champion of our submarine force. Please help me welcome Congressman Joe Courtney. Thank you, Captain Amder, and uh, I want to first of all say thank you to you and your team here at the Nautilus Museum who every single day with a lot of volunteer help uh, make sure that the memory and important uh, message of, of the glorious history of our undersea Navy is preserved every single day, particularly for young people uh, who visit this, this institution from all over the, the country and all over the world. Um, and obviously, uh, organizing today's event is uh, even more of a special moment to put the spotlight on the incredible achievement of our many guests that are here today that traveled so far. Uh, to, to come to Connecticut and, and again, make sure that our nation remembers uh, the significance of their great uh, and wonderful achievement. Webster's Dictionary uh, has, when you look up the definition of pioneer, uh, actually has two separate 
different types of, of definitions. One is a person or group that originates or helps open up a new line of thought or activity or a new method or technical development. The second definition of a pioneer is one of the first to explore new territory. What's I think quite striking when you look at the great people that we have here today who uh, were part of the team that developed and designed and built this submarine and, and sailed it in its amazing voyages, uh, they actually fit both definitions that Webster puts forth uh, of pioneers. What they did was, again, so extraordinary in terms of going to parts of the world that had never been uh, explored before under the ice cap, but also developing a technology that, again, was uh, far beyond, I think, most people's belief could ever be uh, accomplished. Atlantic Monthly in 1959 had a, a wonderful essay uh, describing this incredible achievement. It was written by Commander E.E. E. Kentner, who was the program manager under Admiral Rickover. And I just want to read a small segment, very small segment, of what, how he describes what, what happened here. A nuclear submarine not requiring air for the combustion of fuel in its engines would be able to divorce itself from the Earth's atmosphere and thus become a true submarine rather than a surface ship that could submerge only for short periods. It will be an underwater satellite. To many in high places, this proposal seemed like a trip to the moon. And I think that's important as we reflect back in terms of the struggle and the challenge that Admiral Rickover, I'm sure, had in terms of trying to convince skeptics uh, in Washington, D.C., which today is obviously filled uh, with people of a similar stripe. Uh, and to be able to assemble a team of people who would actually join him with, that, with his amazing vision and to accomplish with stunning success the launching of the USS Nautilus. There is a lesson there today for all of us here in America in 2014. Our country was in the middle of a Cold War. We had a hot war in Korea. We had obviously economic challenges, yet we were still able to come together as a nation and to, to work together as a team to accomplish the great uh, work of, of launching the USS Nautilus. Uh, we should grasp and, and, and embrace that example today. And, it, and, it, and with that embrace, uh, I think our nation still has its brightest days ahead. So to all of you who were part of that team 60 years ago, thank you for your example. And our best compliment to you is to follow it and to live up to it every single day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Before being sworn in on January 5, 2011, Senator Richard Blumenthal served an unprecedented five terms as Connecticut's Attorney General. Now as Connecticut's senior U.S. Senator, he serves on the Senate Armed Services Committee, where he is dedicated to protecting our military members and their families. Please help me welcome Senator Richard Blumenthal. Thank you so much. I am uh, so honored to be with all of you today on this magnificent and momentous celebration, and particularly so with Mrs. Rickover and all of the veterans who have served on this boat, and with Admiral Richardson, who is moving forward into this very challenging era, and thank him and all of the present members of his team for their leadership. I first visited the Nautilus about 25 years ago at the end of a year and a half punishing, grueling campaign for my first statewide office as Attorney General, away nights and weekends, barely a day at home. And my wife and I came to Southeast Connecticut for a weekend alone, arriving at a very romantic small inn. And after a candlelight dinner, she asked me what I would like to do that weekend. And I said, I'd like to visit the Nautilus. I'm not sure it was the answer she expected. <laughs> but we did visit the Nautilus. And I was moved in a way that I was when I visited the bunker underground that Winston Churchill conducted the war, the room where Abraham Lincoln pursued the war during the Civil War of this nation, the way I felt when I visited Hyde Park, where Franklin Roosevelt presided. Such a small space, so much history, 
so much courage, so much perseverance and strength, not only in the wonder, and it was really a wonder at the time of the mechanics and the engineering and technology, but the men who served. And that's really the lesson, isn't it? That that tradition of teamwork, service, sacrifice, not only under the pole, but the days and nights at sea when the challenges of the Cold War were not abstract history as they are now, but an everyday real threat. And the Nautilus was the tip of the spear. The genius that enabled the Nautilus was the product of individual human minds. But the individual came together as a team, year after year, voyage after voyage, mission after mission, because they believed, as, Admiral, as Captain Anderson, the commanding officer of the Nautilus, said when they reached the North Pole on March 3rd, uh, I'm sorry, August 3rd, 1958, for the world, our country, and the Navy. For the world, our country, and the Navy. That's why they risk and sacrifice so much for us. The Nautilus was built right here, an electric boat. It was, in fact, the beginning of an era, an era that is still ongoing today. Just last week, Congressman Courtney and I and uh, others had the great privilege of attending a briefing on the Ohio replacement boat, which will carry into the remainder of this century the technology of nuclear propulsion begun here with the Nautilus, a technology that will make the Nautilus look almost ancient by comparison in its stealth and strength and power and capability. But the Nautilus was the foundation. And the foundation is strong. And we must continue to pursue it with the same unwavering, unstinting commitment that made the Nautilus powerful and great. It is the unstinting commitment and tireless pursuit of the greatest nation in the history of the world. Our national defense and security depends on it. And the great boats that emerge right here in Groton, Connecticut, that help us defend freedom around the world are more necessary than ever. So I'm proud to stand here today with so many great Americans on an iconic American symbol of power, human, and good old Yankee ingenuity and the commitment and courage of some very great American men who manned this boat. And thank you so much for your service. God bless you and God bless our great country. Thank you, Senator. We are greatly honored to have our governor with us today on Connecticut's state ship. His support of our military is evident by his many initiatives that partner the state with the subbase. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Governor Malloy. Good, af good afternoon. It is a great honor to have been invited to participate uh, in this ceremony. Imagine 151 years after the Nautilus name was first used by the American Navy uh, to name a ship. And only 84 years after Jules Verne imagined what a ship like the Nautilus could be. This ship was, in fact, launched, built and launched here in Connecticut. So many of you have attachments to this ship, having served in it, on it, uh, having built it, uh, or having relatives who have done either of those things. To you, I simply want to say on behalf of a grateful state, thank you for your commitment to this project, uh, this program, and this Navy. 
To those serving at this base, uh, I want to say a few words. We are extremely grateful that uh, this base is in our state uh, and that this ship uh, is attached uh, to our state as well. Uh, this base uh, to, uh, to the side over here represents about $3.4 billion in economic activity in the state of Connecticut on a yearly basis. Uh, and it represents about 15,000 direct and indirect jobs in the state of Connecticut. I know that the uh, Defense Department has suggested a BRAC uh, process to be played out in the future. And I want everyone to know, including my good friends in the Navy, uh, that we're prepared for that process if it comes about. We're still the only state in the nation that contributes directly to the build out and improvement of a naval base uh, in the United States. And we will continue that program as we did last year uh, with the planning uh, grant of $3 million to build out a new electrical system on this base. I want others to know that we will compete for our history, for our culture, for our Navy uh, in the coming years. I also want to say uh, to all of you who have been yourselves partisans of the Navy, su uh, supporters of the Navy, there too I am extremely grateful uh, for your care and your love of this service. So let's be clear, Connecticut is the submarine capital of the world. Submariners come here to be educated. They leave on ships from our shores and that will continue to happen in the future. God bless you all. Thank you, Governor. As we commemorate Nautilus's 60th anniversary, we remember the synergy between industry, government agencies, and the military that made it all possible. Shipyards and their workforce are an essential component of our force's history and success, and I am proud to introduce Mr. William Lennon, Vice President for Engineering and Design Programs at Electric Boat, for our shipbuilder's perspective. Thank you, Commander. Governor Malloy, Senator Blumenthal, Congressman Courtney, Admiral Richardson, Mrs. Rickover, uh, the men and women who designed, built, and maintained Nautilus through its years of service, the plank holders and sailors who sailed on her through her years of distinguished service, and all other guests. I am delighted to be here today to speak on behalf of the men and women of Electric Boat and to mark this significance of this anniversary for one of the most technological achievements achieved in history. The commissioning of the Nautilus 60 years ago today will be remembered as a defining moment in the nation, the Navy, and for the sailors who operate these ships, and for the industrial base that designs and builds them. The ability of the United States to project power in, and maintain the safety of the sea lanes dramatically changed the day Nautilus joined the fleet. In a very real way, Nautilus ushered in a cornerstone capability of the nation's defense, which proved pivotal during the Cold War and is still vital to us today. Electric Boat couldn't be prouder of its role it played in producing Nautilus. But for EB, the story didn't start at the commissioning of the Nautilus. It started with a phone call years earlier. As the story goes, while Westinghouse was developing a compact practical reactor in 1950, then Captain Hyman G. Rickover telephoned O.P. Robinson, Jr., Electric Boat's general manager, and a man the Admiral had not yet met. Can you build a hull for an atomic submarine, Rickover asked. Why, sure, sure, Robinson answered. But what do we have to do? I don't know myself, Rickover replied, but we'll work on it. And work on it they did. From the start of the ship's design, Electric Boat worked at flank speed with the Navy, the Navy's labs, and the industry partners to design and build this revolutionary submarine. The design of the Nautilus started a technical revolution that's been remarkable for its record of safety, accomplishment, and continuous pursuit of excellence through the years. The Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program that created Nautilus has set the standard for high performance technology in this country and in the world. But it wasn't always smooth sailing. Let me take you back to a few moments and recap some of the extraordinary challenges involved in the production of this first nuclear-powered submarine. 
First, to design the submarine, Electric Boat embarked on an unprecedented hiring campaign, doubling the size of its engineering workforce, reorganizing and re-engineering the shipyard to support the development of this new technology. There were many technical challenges associated with the design of Nautilus and the development of the naval nuclear power of submarines. Diesel engines and batteries that were the mainstay of conventional submarines were now considered auxiliary systems. New systems were added, reactor plant and steam plant systems that could safely and efficiently use the heat generated from the nuclear reactor to drive steam turbines used to produce electricity and to drive the ship's propellers. Developing of a radiation shielding design that would protect the crew yet fit into the constraints of a submarine's hull. Since no, Nautilus was no longer required to surface and charge batteries as conventionally powered submarines did, new technologies had to be developed to address operation underwater for longer periods of time. How to generate oxygen for the crew. How to navigate without a reference to a fixed point on Earth or a star. Because of all the complexities with this design and the new technologies, Electric Boat built a wooden mock-up of Nautilus to ensure the design could be built operated and maintained before steel was cut. But all of these challenges were overcome and Nautilus was launched on January 21st, 1954. After the launch, Electric Boat and the Navy crew worked tirelessly for almost a year to bring Nautilus to life. Those efforts came to fruition on January 17th, 1955, as Nautilus proceeded down the Thames River, transmitting the historic message underway on nuclear power. Nautilus continued to distinguish herself over a 25-year service life, accomplishing many firsts and setting the standards for the ships to follow her. Since Nautilus, 18 classes of nuclear submarines have been designed and over 200 built. The Navy industry team continues to produce the su finest submarines in the world. From the Virginia class fast attack submarines under construction today, to the design of the Ohio replacement, Electric Boat remains proud and committed to this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lennon. 60 years ago today, then Commander Wilkinson stood on this deck, read his orders to assume command of the Navy's newest and most revolutionary warship, and then directed the XO to set the watch. Vice Admiral Carr, then Lieutenant Junior Grade Carr, was our scheduled keynote speaker and a member of that crew was unable to join us today, but he and I are both honored to introduce two of his fellow ward room members, Captain Ray Engel and Captain David Boyd, and they will speak for the crew. Captain Engel qualified on submarines on USS Pickerel before reporting to Nautilus as her first supply officer. He also served as a plank owner on Skipjack, on USS Thresher as the ship's first engineer, and on USS Nathan Hale as the ship's first XO. He commanded both USS Sea Dragon and USS Ulysses S. Grant. Following his naval career, he continues to serve this nation at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, now known as DARPA. Please help me in welcoming Captain Ray Engel. Thank you very much, and thank all of you, distinguished people, shipmates, and in particular, Mrs. Rickover. Thank you so much for being here. I spent uh, about 40 years of my life in Hawaii, both in the Navy and after the Navy, and I can tell you that a light rain like this is considered to be a blessing. I'm not sure for what, but you're going to have good luck coming. <laughs> and I would also like to say that uh, we had a wonderful time in Cleveland, had a chance to spend probably too much time with uh, Ken Carr, uh, and I talked on phone with uh, Nicholson, Nick, and uh, Les Kelly is, I got his problems too, but I'm sure that those, those three, at least, uh, would be delighted to be with you in spirit, and I thank you for that. Sixty years have passed since Dave Boyd and I, among others in the first crew of the Nautilus, stood on the deck of this incredible ship. 
I have been asked to share a few of these thoughts of, the de of that day and some of the observations over the years of its significance. Let me set the stage. Admiral Rickover had managed to not only be the Navy manager of the Nautilus project, he had acquired a similar duty within the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC. With both titles, he could send directions to himself in the other role. <laughs> he also established a very close relationship with the U.S. Congress, who had the parse springs for this. He selected and trained most of the early engineering crew and prospective commanding officer who worked in the S-1W prototype at the AEC Phyllis, uh, facility in, in Idaho. Uh, for those who may not get that, S stands for submarine. One, because it was the first design, and Westinghouse stood for Westinghouse. These were the people who would were be authorized to operate the engineering plant being built for Nautilus, beginning with the hot, high-pressure testing of the piping of the nuclear power and, pro and propulsion plants, a first for nuclear technology in the... In addition to the engineers, the Navy had ordered four junior officers and additional crew with weapons, com weapons communications, and supply and commerce. The supply and commissary job was mine. As the only bachelor in the wardroom, I lived at the BOQ at the submarines. That's batch off quarters. As the need for a crew authorized to do the testing approached, the ship received a special initial uh, provisional acceptance status, and our officer in charge, Commander E.P. Dennis uh, Wilkinson, was ordered to report directly to the Commander Submarines Atlantic Fleet, whose headquarters was here at the New London sub base, just up over there. Uh, we also had him ordered uh, to uh, oh yeah, a, a formal uh, full dress commissioning was set for September 30th, 1954. As I stood on the deck on that day, I realized that Nautilus was already changing the status and role of submarines. Previously, submarine builders built and tested the ships, including sea trials, with their own trial crews now we perform much of the building testing and we would take the ship to sea. The ship had already earned national audience and notice. News media jumped at any story that related to Nautilus and as we learned, anyone who had contributed a component, they would speak with pride, pride, pride with their contribution. In, in those days, gasoline credit cards were a new phenomenon made of cardboard with names and addresses typed or printed on them. Since I used the ship as my mail address, that was the address the men at the pump read. Often they would tell me that one of their relatives had something to do with the building of the components for the ship or they worked at Electric Buck. I quickly learned that if I was in a hurry, I paid cash. In addition to the groundbreaking nuclear power and other major firsts, some subtle changes occurred in lesser challenges. We began to learn that the one-size-fits-all did not fit this new, bigger sub. Perhaps the first alert was requisitioning typewriters. Submarines get manual typewriters, we were told. We wanted some electric typewriters. We had to forward our request up to the Secretary of the Navy to get one electric, temp and that was only because we had said that we needed for sending reports to the AEC. Then Captain Wilkinson said he wanted to post information in more places in the ship than carbon paper copies would serve. Get me a ditto machine. So back to the high places in Washington, they gave in but the machine had to be hand cranked. We soon realized that we really didn't know much about the ditto fluid. We started a search for a safer fluid for our enclosed 
atmosphere. The winner of the search was pure grain alcohol. I had custody of two gallons stored in a locked steam chest. Operating under the force commander did have its advantages. If I needed more money for some mooring lines or more lube oil, I went directly to the supply officer on the Admiral's staff. And it wasn't long before our reputation as a high priority customer made the rounds of the waterfront. Their nickname for us was Lola, referring to the popular song, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Looking back now, I must say that the size and impact of the new submarines in the fleet and their implied sea power has become reflected in their names. Battleships and cruisers that formerly carried state and city's names have ceded that privilege to the submarines that followed. Within a few years, we called them ships, no longer boats. September 30th, 1954 was getting closer. The full dress commissioning would be the Navy's big show and everyone involved knew the world would be watching. Nuclear power harnessed for propulsion, not destruction, was big news. The pressure was on and we all knew that when pressure was unexpected, things could happen. Immediately after the invocation, the Commandant of the 3rd Naval District, the Tutsar Admiral, and who had the authority to order us as commission, he, he went and talked and told us all of the wonderful things. We were really kind of funny because he kept repeating as he talked, Captain Shea and his gallant crew, Captain Shea and his crew. We later learned his staff had not updated the blanks in the standard commissioning speech. No harm, no foul. <laughs> the flag was hoisted, the commissioning pennant was unfurled, the executive officer, Dean Axine, ordered the, the watch to be set again. Anyhow, the, the builder was represented by John J. Hopkins, General Dynamics Chairman of the Board. He was to present the commissioning plaque to the ship's captain. Nautilus would become the first anything to be powered by controlled nuclear energy. Mr. Hopkins made his delivery speech and then reached under the podium for the commissioning plaque. Someone must have moved the podium for the plaque had shifted away from his reach. As he bent and groped in the symbolic plaque, the world may or may not have heard him, but we did as he muttered under his breath, where is the expletive deleted <laughs> thing? Final, finally, uh, Admiral, we had two four-star admirals there, the uh, number two uh, CNO and, uh, and the Admiral uh, Wright, who was uh, Sink Lant and Sink Lant Fleet. Uh, and he had some, talked about the future and it was quite inspiring. Now, with the official event behind us, we went to the officers club for the reception. As the only bachelor officer aboard, I escorted the ComSub Lant Chief of Staff's daughter. But now some of my thoughts turned to the next day when I was to have my first date with Miss Claire Wallach. We had met casually over three or four times in the spring and summer and she interested me. I had, a, I had bri bribed a friend of mine with tickets to the commissioning if he would take Claire. I had invited Claire to a football game on Saturday, October 1st. The conversation had gone something like this. Claire thinking local, when would you like to pick me up? I said, about 6.30 a.m. Where are we going? Navy's playing at Dartmouth. It's about a five hour drive. Well, when will we get back? Late Sunday night. We're going to spend the night up at Dana's place in New Hampshire. But don't worry, my classmate, Babe Boyd, and his wife, Alice, and his mother 
will be with us and you will share a room with Dave's mother. <laughs> that night, we spent a few hours sitting at a picnic table by the Ellis River, just talking and getting to know each other. Uh, tomorrow is the 60th anniversary of that first date. And next July 31st is our 60th wedding anniversary. Claire has been my guiding guard through six tours on nuclear submarines, including four new constructions, three Nautilus, Skipjack, and Thresher were first of class, the fourth with us an SSBN executive officer. My nearly five years of command was split between an attack submarine and a missile submarine. Thanks for the memories, professional and person, and in Dennis Wilkinson's worlds. They may make them better, but they'll never be first. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Engel. <laughs> Captain Boyd was commissioned in 1950, and like all other Nautilus plank owners, qualified first on a diesel submarine. For him, it was USS Harger. He reported to Nautilus in 1953 and served here until 1955. He is also a plank owner on USS Skate. He commanded the nuclear prototype in Windsor, Connecticut, USS Permit, USS Theodore Roosevelt, and the submarine tender USS Dixon. He completed his naval career as the commander of the Naval Training Center in Orlando, Florida. Please help me welcome Captain David Boyd. Thank you, Captain, Emma Richardson, distinguished guests, friends and family of the Nautilus. Um, my wife, uh, Alice, and I live in drought-stricken California. And uh, like Ray, this is uh, mana from heaven, although it must be a drag on the locals. But the uh, rain is wonderful for us. Uh, I am uh, disappointed, and anyone who knows them is also disappointed, that our two surviving USN retired flag officers from the commissioning crew of the Nautilus, Vice Admiral Nick Nicholson and Vice Admiral Ken Carr, are not able to be with us uh, here today. As Ray mentioned, we visited with uh, Ken Carr in Cleveland and he has things well under control in his uh, recovery from a stroke. He uh, obtained a two-hour liberty from the rehab hospital where he now is to uh, visit the Nautilus Convention. I accompanied uh, him to uh, the car uh, that would take him, the vehicle that would take him back to the uh, rehab hospital. He was in a wheelchair. I noted as uh, Admiral Carr was wheeled up the ramp into the car that the driver simulated a bosun pipe uh, whistle rendering honors. So it's obvious that uh, Vice Admiral Ken Carr has things uh, well under control. Uh, Vice Admiral Nick Nicholson's uh, wife is ailing and he is not able to be with us today for that uh, reason. And so it is that the two junior officers of the Nautilus uh, commissioning crew, Ray Engel and Dave Boyd, are here trying to uh, fill their uh, considerably larger shoes. Much has changed between the Nautilus commissioned 60 years ago and the modern submarines that now ply the Thames behind me. Dramatic increases in capabilities, complexity, size, and also, of course, cost are a few that come to mind. On the other hand, some basic elements of submarining remain unchanged, like the hazards involved. For example, the relentless force of the ocean that presses on every square inch of the submarine exposed to it. The new capabilities in our modern submarines are exploited and the hazards that were controlled by the Nautilus crew and are now controlled by 
smart young Navy men and now Navy women who volunteer and who are selected, trained, qualified, and led to operate the submarines safely and carry out assigned missions. Yes, it took the collective efforts of thousands of men and women all over this great country who were led by Admiral Rickover and his staff and who did the science, design, engineering, construction of the ship and its systems and equipment to bring Nautilus from concept to a completed ship. But it was then Commander and later Captain Dennis Wilkinson who organized and led the officers and enlisted personnel from being only initially a collection of individuals to form a trained, qualified, and inspired crew ready to cast off the mooring lines and take Nautilus to sea. Captain Wilkinson had the confidence of Admiral Rickover, and he had a rare combination of character, determination, persuasiveness, common sense, education, training, and experience to do this very challenging job. As a junior officer in his wardroom, I received his attention daily and am a better person because of it. I worked hard to learn the ship in detail, climbing through ballast tanks and tracing piping in the bilges. And I was always amazed when Captain Wilkinson knew more about some t detail than I did not by climbing through tanks himself, but applying his brain to take things he did know, ask questions, analyze data, and deduce the correct answer to some new problem. One of my takeaways from being in Captain Wilkinson's crew concerns something that is as important today as it was then to the safe operation and maintenance of submarine systems and equipment. Captain Wilkinson was at the forefront of an important and new at the time emphasis on operating and maintaining systems and equipment using a standards-based approach instead of the long-standing expert-based approach. Standards-based means developing clear, correct, and complete operating procedures and maintenance work instructions that are based on and incorporated applicable rules and requirements and the input of experts and then performing the procedures and instructions consistently as written. For comparison, the expert-based approach depends mainly on an individual expert's experience, skill, and knowledge which differ between individuals and may differ really in the same individual at different times or how he happen to uh, get up in the morning. The standards-based approach is critical to consistently achieve required human performance across many crews. When things go wrong, and they do in any hazardous occupation, the event is probably human-caused wholly or to some degree. A high level of human performance is therefore essential. Along with everything else on Captain Wilkinson's mind in the months before commissioning Nautilus, he set demanding standards and made clear his expectations for developing and implementing high quality operating procedures. They were drafted with inputs, multiple reviews, and detailed walk downs by senior petty officers, and then reviewed and approved by the ship's department head. Captain Wilkinson reviewed a sample of the approved procedures himself, and his markups made clear his expectations to do better. One small but important part of Captain Wilkinson's legacy for the submarine Navy is this sub-standards-based approach, which lives on through the continuing emphasis on developing and implementing high quality operating procedures and work instructions in the submarine Navy. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Boyd.
The existence of Nautilus in 1954 would not have been possible without the tenacity, imagination, creativity, and diligence of the father of our nuclear Navy, Admiral Hyman G. Rickover. The culture of technological excellence and integrity that is the hallmark of our submarine force today has been shaped, stewarded, and led by the Naval Reactors Organization that he founded. We are greatly honored to have here with us today Admiral John Richardson, Director, Naval Reactors. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I just have to say, Ben, that uh, this event would uh, not have happened without your creativity and your leaning forward to uh, have the foresight to commemorate this 60th anniversary in such fine style. I got to tell you that uh, Nautilus looks absolutely fantastic. That's a tribute to you and your team. I think we all should uh, recognize this team for keeping her in such great shape. Especially want to recognize all of the Nautilus crew members and their families, past and present. Uh, we had the opportunity to recognize especially the plank owners, uh, Senator Blumenthal, Congressman Courtney, Governor Malloy, thank all of you, submarine leaders, submarine families, submarine force supporters and friends. Welcome to the only place to be in the submarine force today here on, you know, there's been a lot of comments about the weather. This is a terrific submarine day in my mind. This is perfect submarine weather. Now, I don't know how I can uh, really sum up. There's been so much uh, said to this morning about uh, what Nautilus has meant, what she meant for the country, the team that put her together. And I thought maybe it would be best if I just quickly drew some threads uh, to tie together the comments of the speakers who have come before me. You know, much has been said of the team that was required to make this magnificent ship happen. And, uh, you know, that continues today. It was a team that, uh, as has been said, was comprised of not only the Department of the Navy, but also the, the Atomic Energy Commission, now the, D, the Department of Energy. That same team persists today as the, as, uh, the Naval Reactor staff is a uh, dual-hatted organization with the Navy and Energy. Uh, I report both to Secretary Mabus, the Secretary of the Navy, and Secretary Moniz. And uh, this would not have happened without that, that uh, team, which continues to do such good work today. It, uh, it involved a uh, academics, you know, the best scientists in the world, uh, there at the labs at the time, uh, at Oak Ridge, and then up in New York, and in Pittsburgh, and out in Idaho. And uh, that team persists today. We still continue to have the very sharpest minds in the country uh, with top facilities in those locations, uh, currently led by Mr. John Wolf, who is here today uh, to represent all of, uh, of his team. Uh, certainly, it would not happen without terrific support from our lawmakers at the time. And uh, Senator Blumenthal and Congressman Courtney, Governor Malloy are here to symbolize that that support continues strong to this day as we, the Navy and energy team, the shipbuilders continue to produce the finest submarines in the world. I mentioned the shipbuilders, such a crucial role. Mr. Lennon highlighted the uh, role of electric boat back in the 50s as we brought Nautilus together and that uh, role continues today as we produce Virginia-class submarines and uh, the Ohio replacement submarines. Uh, but most of all, I think uh, we're here to recognize those uh, men and their families who manned and went down in the sea in Nautilus uh, serving on her. And as with all the other teams, today we continue to get amazingly dedicated men and women and their families who man our ships and submarines today uh, in defense of the nation's interests. So this team that came together at the time was so critical to the magic that made Nautilus happen, and that team persists today almost intact, just as vigorous, just as leaning forward to make your modern Navy happen in such great style. You know, much has been said about the uh, the path uh, to, to bringing Nautilus together. And it is a remarkable path, 
Uh, we're here to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the commissioning in 1954 uh, of the first harnessing of nuclear power for peaceful purposes uh, in a propulsion uh, mission. And, uh, you know, it's, it's instructive to remember that, you know, the first demonstration of a critical reactor, the, the theoretical, you know, idea was first demonstrated only 12 years before in 1942 in the city of Chicago by the physicist Enrico Fermi. Uh, just a very short time after that, uh, then Captain Rickover was in Tennessee forward thinking how, he could, how could he harness this energy and, uh, and put it to use on a submarine for the nation's uh, interests. In 1950, just eight years later, construction on Nautilus started. 1952, the keel was laid. In 1953, the prototype that uh, was mentioned out in the Idaho desert first became critical. And uh, soon after, completed a simulated transatlantic voyage, you know, simulating the demands on that reactor plant that would be seen when Nautilus went to sea. And then, as uh, was said, and, and, and the reason we're here today in 1954, just a 12 short years after the initial demonstration of the concept, Nautilus was launched and commissioned. In uh, January of next year, we will mark the 60th anniversary of that, uh, uh, of her first underway, when Nautilus came underway on nuclear power. And so this, you know, accelerating and harnessing of technology that made Nautilus uh, a reality in the 50s, that also persists today. I thought uh, what I would do is just try and highlight, you know, the impact of Nautilus in her time at their strategic, the operational and the tactical level, because Nautilus covered the entire spectrum. As I said, at the strategic level, Nautilus was the first use, a bold step in the uh, atomic age, uh, using, harnessing the uh, power of uh, nuclear fission for peaceful, non-weapons use. Uh, she was the nation's answer during the Cold War to Sputnik, and she was the, fo the forward thrust, the submarine force has a history of being the first response, and Nautilus was, uh, was there. Uh, soon after her underway, uh, she achieved a number of milestones. In 1958, the Transpolar Voyage, uh, a major success, and a message to all who were watching that we were in this Cold War to win it. And uh, nuclear-powered submarines continue to pay, play a vital role in the arms race. Uh, with the advent of nuclear propulsion, we can now stay submerged essentially indefinitely. That allowed us to place a decisive number of uh, weapons on board the submarine, uh, keep them out of uh, sight but responsive, and that slowed the whole problem down in a, a theory of deterrence, a triad that emerged then and still continues to serve us today. It wasn't just submarines in this atomic age either. Uh, in 1960, Enterprise was launched and commissioned in 1961. Uh, and then the nation took off. Uh, by 1967, uh, just over a decade later, we had commissioned 73 submarines, atomic submarines, 32 attack submarines, and 41 SSBNs. We had also co commissioned three nuclear cruisers and the enterprise. So at a strategic level, Nautilus was a decisive leader and, a, and a, a clear message to all who were watching. At the operational level, nuclear propulsion changed naval warfare forever. It brought the whole fleet up to new standards. It established personnel safety standards and environmental standards. Admiral Rickover's standard for safety was that he was going to design and build this ship as if his son and daughter was going to uh, get underway. And that was and still is the standard we build today, uh, our ships with today. It's embedded in the DNA of naval reactors, and he established that culture back in the 50s, the culture of responsibility, the culture of facing the facts, 
culture of technical rigor, standards-based, as uh, the captain said, the, the culture of complete staff work. All of those persist today. At the tactical level, Nautilus shattered all performance records of a submarine, shattered speed and distance records, leading the way for other nuclear-powered warships. The warships like Triton, who during Operation Sandblast would be the first vessel to circumnavigate the world to, uh, submerged. So Nautilus was a proud leader at the strategic, operational, and tactical level, a tradition of innovation which continues to this day. Congressman Courtney said it very eloquently, the best way that we can pay tribute to the plank owners and the crewmen uh, of Nautilus, the spirit of Nautilus, is to continue to lean forward and, uh, and continue to innovate. Admiral Rickover said it at the time. The Nautilus, he said, did not mark the end of a technological road. It marked the beginning. And so what does that mean today? Well, we are Consider, we should consider a renaissance in the spirit of Nautilus, a renaissance involving speed of technology to the fleet with technical rigor, with high standards, and with clear responsibility and accountability. And we're doing that with the Virginia-class submarine, maintaining our fast attack presence. The Navy has just awarded the largest shipbuilding con uh, contract for 10 new submarines over $17 billion for those ships. I'm going to pause while this train conducts a flyby, okay? Just our luck, this happens to be the longest train to uh, go by Groton at this week. <laughs> Can you hear me okay if I keep going? All right, good. I'll, I'll press on. All right. Uh, you know, and, and technologically, we have continued to move forward as well. Uh, the Nautilus Corps lasted about a year and a half, maybe two years before she needed to be refueled. The uh, reactor plants that we are putting in modern submarines will last the entire life of the ship, 33 years on Virginia, and in the Ohio replacement submarine, more than 40 years. Uh, this Ohio replacement submarine has been mentioned as well. It is our next step in technology and our next step in maintaining the nation's strategic deterrence. It is on track right across the river at uh, Electric Boat to begin construction in 2021 and beyond patrol in 2031. It will include new technologies like electric drive to keep the ship amazingly stealthy, and it will have a uh, core that will last 40 years. Nautilus core would steam about 62,000 miles. The core on the Ohio replacement will steam for over 1 million miles. To wrap it all up, to all of the Nautilus crew members, past and present, thank you for your service. Thank you for inspiring a generation of submarine sailors. You know, we talked about the team. We talked about the technology. We talked about the impact that the Nautilus had at the strategic and the operational and tactical level. Uh, none of that would have been possible without the father of that team, which was Admiral Rickover. The nuclear made po uh, Navy was made possible by his determination by his per perseverance, by his hard work, by his vision, by his unrelenting adherence to standards. And Mrs. Rickover, we are so, so proud and honored that you could join us today. But I'd like all of us uh, to honor uh, the Admiral Rickover and Mrs. Rickover with a round of applause, please. There's one other person, I think, uh, that we need to honor here today as well. You know, in the Navy, the, uh, 
the ship and the captain are almost interchangeable. They merge to become one single whole. And so often when we're talking about a particular ship, the name of the ship and the name of the CEO, the commanding officer, are completely interchangeable. The commanding officer is the ship. And it was exactly so uh, when Nautilus was launched. And you've heard uh, from the crew members themselves the respect and affection that they had for their captain, uh, Commander Dennis Wilkinson. He was handpicked for this mission, uh, the first CEO of our two firsts. He was not only the CEO of the first nuclear submarine Nautilus, but went on to command the, the uh, first uh, nuclear-powered uh, surface ship, the USS Long Beach. You know, uh, that famous message, it, this is the vision of, uh, of Admiral Wilkinson. You know, the Navy knew that when Nautilus got underway, that was going to be a major big deal. The world was watching. And, uh, you know, similarly to uh, when uh, we first landed on the moon, there would be this moment where Captain Wilkinson would have you know, a message to provide to the world. And, you know, the public affairs community was, was uh, deeply involved. And they said, you know, we'd like to draft you a, a message for your consideration. And Captain Wilkinson said, sure, go ahead. Uh, knock yourself out. And so just be on that day as the uh, ship was getting underway, the team came and they had prepared, you know, a, a, about a two-page message that went on about the historical significance but, uh, you know, Captain, uh, Commander Wilkinson, later Admiral Wilkinson, knew that, you know, sometimes less is more. And it was that, that pivotal message, underway on nuclear power, one sentence, that has uh, captured the spirit of the atomic age ever since and is a, a sign of just uh, of the, the mind of uh, Captain Wilkinson, efficient, effective, not a wasted syllable, not a wasted moment, right to the point. Uh, Commander Wilkinson uh, passed away this past year, but I would like to take a moment now to recognize the Wilkinson family and to present them with a flag. This flag was flying on Nautilus on the day that Admiral Wilkinson passed away, and we'll take a moment now to present this flag and family. And let's give them a round of applause as well. Well, thank you all very much for coming today. You've many of you have traveled a long distance to be here. And uh, as I said, if you are a nuclear submariner, this is the place you want to be today. I want to uh, ask you all as we, as we conclude the ceremony and move back to our homes that we continue to keep all of our submariners, sailors, airmen, and Marines in, uh, and soldiers in our prayers. Please keep them in your first prayer in the morning and the last prayer at night for those men and women on patrol in defense of our great nation. God bless the Navy. God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. The history of Nautilus is the history of our modern submarine force. The ship's designers, builders, and crew represent an unbroken link from the dawn of the nuclear power age through today. We will honor this history with the passing of a 60th anniversary flag by members representing the Nautilus team throughout the years. The ship's history starts with the father of our nuclear Navy, Admiral Hyman G. Rickover. His legendary leadership in designing and building the first power reactor for submarine propulsion began in 1946 and was demonstrated to the world when the ship got underway on nuclear power a mere nine years later. 
We are honored to have his wife and the sponsor of the USS Hyman G. Rickover, Mrs. Eleanor Rickover, with us today to honor his legacy. Mr. Bernie Resnick was at Naval Reactors and helped design Nautilus's mechanical systems in the 1950s. He represents those designers that made this ship possible. <laughs> Senior, Chief, Senior Chief Torpedoman Bill Engel is a Nautilus plank owner serving on board from 1954 to 56. He's also the principal designer of the ship's logo and the co-designer of our 60th anniversary flag. <laughs> Quartermaster John Ewell served on Nautilus from 1957 1960 and was a member of the crew during her historic first voyage to the North Pole. He's also the co-designer of our 60th anniversary flag. <laughs> also with us today is Rear Admiral Metzel. He served as the ship's fourth commanding officer from 1961 to 63 and he is a senior member of the Nautilus crew present with us today. Master Chief Engineer Rob Ringer is also a Nautilus plank owner, serving from 1954 to 57, and then again from 1960 to 66, including three years as the ship's chief of the boat. <laughs> Representing the Nautilus crew in the 1970s is machinist mate Stephen Bogert. He served from 1970 to 1972 in M Division. Rear Admiral Richard Rydell serves as the ship's ninth and final commanding officer from 1976 until her decommissioning in 1980. He's also with us today with his family. <laughs> Captain John Allman serves as the ship's officer in charge under tow in 1985, taking the ship from Mare Island Naval Shipyard after her historic ship conversion through the Panama Canal and home to Groton. Mrs. Marilyn Charette proudly represents her husband, Commander Al Charette, and all Nautilus docents, volunteers, and alumni. Al Charette was a sonar supervisor when Nautilus became the first ship to achieve the North Pole on August 3, 1958, and remained actively involved with the ship, museum, and their alumni throughout his life. Master Chief Machinist Mate Jim Cruiser is here. He was a decommissioning, he was on the decommissioning crew and then served again as the Command Master Chief at Historic Ship Nautilus from 1988 to 1991, representing our historic ship crew. <laughs> representing today's crew is Chief Machinist Mate Clarence Early. He is, a, he is the crew and the Navy's newest Chief Petty Officer he was promoted to chief on September 16th of this year. <laughs> chief Early is bringing the flag to electrician's mate first class Levi Smith, who will fly it from the sail. Petty Officer Smith reported to Historic Ship Nautilus in 2012 and was selected as Nautilus's 2013 Sailor of the Year.
This flag, designed by Nautilus crew members, represents over 60 years of history. And thank you so much for all of our, our participants today representing that history with us today. Well, guests, please rise and stand as able for the benediction and remain standing for the departure of the official party. Let us pray. Eternal God, you hold all of us in the palm of your hand. Today we, we pause to remember those, our friends, our shipmates, our family, who cannot be with us here today. And as we depart from this place, we know we go underway on your power facing unforeseen challenges and unmitigated danger, knowing that you help us to navigate our way through them with the boldness, courage, and resolve demonstrated by this ship and her crew. We pray for your blessing on us, our armed forces deployed throughout the world, and our families at home. In your name we pray, amen. Post the side, boys. Governor, Connecticut, departing. Member, United States Senate, departing. <laughs> Member, United States Congress, departing. Naval reactors departing. <laughs> Captain, United States Navy retired, departing. Captain, United States Navy retired, departing. <laughs> Mr. Lennon, electric boat vice president, departing. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. I'd like to offer a special note of thanks to all those who helped make this event possible today, the entire staff and crew of the, sh of the ship, with special thanks to Linda Williams, Bruce Rader, and Senior Chief Grimaldi, who did an amazing amount of work to make this happen, the Submarine Force Library and Museum Association, uh, Mr. Chris Zenden, Mr. Al Morales, Lieutenant Commander Scott Shero, and Bill Engel. Music today was provided by the United States Coast Guard Band under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Adam, Al, Adam Williamson. 
You are cordially invited to join us for a reception being hosted by the Submarine Force Library and Museum Association in the museum's main hall. Thank you for joining us.